started recording. We have started recording. Okay, okay. yeah, okay. continue. I hope everyone is okay with it. Yes. All right. In just initial set of things, I'm just trying to get my screen to be shared. Just give me a second. Are you guys able to see my screen? I know you guys are able to. Let me know. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, we can. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Fire Pillage in the chapter to just give us so giving us this opportunity to talk about our experiences so far, team. You know, today what we are trying to really showcase is our learning of really working in blockchain as an organization, right? That's essentially what we are hoping to do. Provide a lot of implementers perspective. Right. So really about our own journey, our own challenges, our own learnings. You know, we are hoping to really share what we have learned and also are really looking forward to uh, you know, answer any questions that you may have and potentially even would love for you guys to challenge some of the things that you have done so that way in the whole process, we all can learn together as well. Right. So that's essentially what it is. As you can see, a lot of our team members also have come in. Some of them have actually worked on this particular project. They're available and they can even probably respond to some questions in the chat if anybody has as we are speaking along the way. I'm known to be uh, speaking very, very fast. So people have actually always complained that I speak really, really fast. So please do let me know if I'm going without a stop and then I'd be happy to step back. You know, uh, anytime would be a good time to ask questions, you know, stop me, ask me questions. I'd be happy to give you an answer. If I don't know, I'll go back, find out and I'll respond back to you. Okay, so with that, we'll just kind of quickly uh, move forward. Who are we essentially? as an organization, right? So we basically are a bunch of engineers. We were started about five years ago as an organization. We are a little over 70 people. In fact, you will see some of those pictures here all standing here. Uh, we are based out of Bangalore. We are predominantly a consulting organization. You know, we actually broadly have a lot of work that we've done within web mobility and even some work on the blockchain space as well. In fact, when we started this whole organization about five years ago between me and Girish, our whole idea was to be able to really see what can we do within the area of blockchain. Uh, you know, we're very excited about what blockchain, blockchain as a technology can do on both enterprise as well as crypto use cases, right? So essentially, you know, we've been working over the last five years predominantly uh, across India, US, Canada, and Australia, right? So what are we really here today to do? We are really here to today to be able to share our journey, right, of our, our, our whole understanding of decentralization. In fact, I think, you know, we all, we all were very we were all trying to really understand what essentially blockchain is about and how did we really do, right? So when we started, in fact, as an organization, you know, we kind of started the whole idea with the idea of genesis of the organization itself, right? So essentially in terms of when we started the organization, in fact, the first name for the company was called Trust Blocks because we wanted to see if we can build an entire organization on blockchain, but the government wouldn't give us the word trust because it's a reserved keyword, you know? We, we changed to many other names and finally eventually landed on Exothart. That's another story. But then we've always been focused on blockchain as a, as a capability and what do we do, right? So we've kind of played around, played around with a lot of frameworks. We have worked on some engagements, but then we were always looking at what would be the non-crypto use cases, right? As an organization to see where can essentially blockchain impact and what sort of benefits can it actually bring, right? And we always, as a part of our capability center exercise, we were trying to search for one specific problem that we can play around with and understand, right? So whether, what would be the power of blockchain? You know, in 2018, Hyperledger Fabric was by far the most famous, right? So enterprise blockchain framework and we got interested in that. You know, I honestly found it really challenging to learn because of the number of aspects that actually uh, Fabric got in, right? Compared to probably a typical uh, permissionless uh, blockchain networks, right? So, but then we thought, you know what, we should really take one specific problem and start playing around with it. And then, you know, we took about a year or two to be able to find out what the problem was. And eventually we started looking at, you know, e-signature, right? So it seemed to be like a very natural problem that we thought we should start taking and start solving, right? So as a team together, right? So we kind of put together to say, you know, today there are a lot of centralized e-signature solutions, right? Like DocuSign, HelloSign, Adobe Sign. But then, you know, um, signature seems to be the most important thing that is very valuable and more, more often than not to put it on a document that is very sensitive to the organization. So how can we really start looking at building one simple solution that can actually help us decentralize the whole idea of e-signature itself, right? Now, if you really think about e-signature, right, it also has some interesting properties that we would need 
for it to be a typical blockchain solution, right? So what is it? You know, we need to have immutability, right? Once you sign a document, it cannot change. You need provenance, right? Which means you need to be able to really understand what is the origin of this particular signature and the document. And finality also is needed, right? Basically, once a document is signed, then nobody can actually change it, right? So all of those particular things is needed in a document as, or in an e-signature sort of a solution. So it kind of seemed really a nice thing that a blockchain already provides, right? Digital records management was one of the other things that actually needed, right? So you need to be able to refer it, go back to it, and be able to talk about it whenever it was needed. And PK infrastructure, right? So essentially, if you really look at all the digital signature solutions today, you already have some form of public key, private key combinations. And you know, solutions like Hyperledger already seem to provide that as a part of MSP and everything. Right. And of course, the multi-party involvement, right? Finally. When it comes to a digital signature sort of a solution, you have more than one part involved and how do we really look at it? So it felt like a good problem for us to go after and then we started working on that, <clears throat> right? So now what was the questions that we were trying to answer really, right? How much of the features that actually we want on an e-signature a solution could actually be just done with some of the out of the box features that a blockchain, right? So specifically something like Fabric would offer. That was the first question, right? And secondly, could we actually create a verifiable signature? Right? So if you could do that, then, and especially using some of those out-of-the-box features that actually the solution provides today, it became very easy for us to be able to, you know, authoritatively, or rather, it became very easy for us to authoritatively talk about a specific provenance of a document or an identity of an individual, right? So those were some of the questions that we were trying to answer through this. Now, it is a very fairly well-established design journey, right? So if you really look at it, you know, when it comes to this whole e-signature solution, you know, we actually have an internal product design team. We kind of went to them, we told them saying, hey, we want to build a, a, an e-signature solution. Can you actually help us? So they kind of really quickly put together an entire wireframe and gave it to us. You know, we actually have only three distinctive flows if you really look at it, right? At a high level, you would actually sign up or sign in, right? Especially in a, in a B2C sort of scenario. But in a B2B scenario, you would typically go in through like a single sign-on solution, right? And then there is actually a flow design itself, right? So where you're trying to, design the entire signature setup. We will, we'll see that in a demo very quickly. And then of course, the entire signature process itself, right? You would finally complete the signature process, right? So it was a fairly well-established design direction. We just took that. Are you guys able to hear me clearly? I hope so. It is very quiet. So I'm hoping- Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank Much you. interesting thing. So we are okay. listening to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. So then, you know, how did we really go about it, right? From an architectural perspective, right? The first cut, Without, we'll make it very simple, right? You just have a single organization. You just set up one orderer, right? And then you just set up one channel. And then you just set up one peer, right? So we don't want to complicate anything further. We will just kind of create it as one setup at this point of time. And then we'll just move forward. Now, the next couple of things that actually we wanted in this whole process is, you know, you need a way to be able to upload a document and store it somewhere. You need a way to be able to convert the document into something that's immutable, right? Like a, like a PDF format you will need an email service, right? So we started working on each of those particular things, right? And each of those essentially became the API solution. And it's kind of sat outside of the blockchain network. Now, quite interestingly, right? So sometimes there is this whole question about not to blockchain or not to blockchain. I don't know if you guys have actually seen this. You know, this document was actually put together by National Institute of Standards and Technology, right? The US Department of Commerce, almost like about uh, 2018. Right? It kind of put a really nice algorithm to figure out if you really need a blockchain to implement, or could you just do it with a simple database, right? Like for example, if you just need a consistent data source, all you need is email spreadsheets, right? Or if you need more than one entity to contribute to the data, then you consider just a, a database, right? So if you record once, right, and then you would never actually update or delete, you could still do it using a database, right? Are there any sensitive identifiers? You can just deal with just some encrypted database. If you have entities that has hard time deciding who should be in control of the data store, then you can actually go for a managed database, right? And if all of those things essentially kind of come together, then you potentially have a use case for a blockchain, right? So I mean, there's a quite an interesting thought process that has actually gone, and I'm sure all of you guys have gone through, at least I have always struggled in a meeting when I'm sitting and figuring out whether a specific solution actually needs a blockchain or not. Right, or it could be done with a simple data store. Right, so it is something that I continue to struggle with. I probably see we have gotten clearer over a period of time, but definitely needs some time. But in our case, if you really look at it, you know, when you are a user, 
you know, whenever you're actually trying to register your document itself, your, your signature, right? You need to actually do that. Your email, now that has to be very clearly audited, available, and identified, right? So that is something that was with Hawk was really belonged into the blockchain. And the second one essentially was the entire signature process itself, right? Once you start a signature process and kind of take you through the whole thing, then the entire each and every step needed to be captured because each of those steps needed to be auditable. It needed to be traceable, right? So those were the two things that we thought should essentially go into the blockchain itself. Now, <clears throat> from an application design perspective itself, you know, the front end we chose React, right? So it was very easy for us to do. In fact, I honestly believe we spent a lot more time on building the front end than actually building the entire blockchain itself, even though the POC was for uh, blockchain. But, you know, for us to really build a compelling application, it really took us some time, right? So, but then on the server side, essentially, you know, we built out the blockchain API. We used Jin and Golang as a framework. It became, uh, and you know, we wanted to use Go in general. I'm, and I'm a big, you know, after we have actually started using it, it became really a very, very powerful thing for us because we have found that, you know, Golang actually gives you really, really significant performance at very low memory footprints, right? Something that actually was given, shown to us time and again. And even for the blockchain smart contract languages, we actually chose Golang as well. But the others, we kind of defaulted to Fastify and Node.js kind of things. And we leveraged some existing open source libraries like Libre for uh, you know, uh, PDF to uh, Word to PDF conversion and things of that sort. Uh, the next thing that we needed was user management, right? So user management to begin with, I actually went with AWS Cognito and file storage, we actually went with AWS S3, right? And then, of course, on the blockchain side, we already you know, started using all the available existing features, right? Like Postgres for our certificate authority and management and uh, CouchDB for all the smart contracts and management, right? So those were the ones. Now, there is an interesting thing here, right? Where we were trying to challenge, you know, this was not a fully decentralized solution at this point of time. You know why? Because AWS Cognito and AWS S3 still kind of came from a centralized world, so to say, right? Then we were like, Maybe this is not the total decentralization journey that actually we could do. And we started challenging ourselves to see what could we do, right? That's when we kind of stumbled upon IPFS. <clears throat> so we were looking at IPFS and we realized that, you know, we could also set up private IPFS clusters, right? So it kind of took us some time to dig through the whole thing, but then we eventually were successful in doing that, right? So we were able to actually build an IPFS, IPFS based backend for a decentralized solution a decentralized storage solution, sorry, right? And then we wanted to get away from AWS Cognito, right? So we, we started exploring some of the decentralized identity management solutions, but you know we thought maybe for us, all we need is a simple application authentication. So we just went ahead and we wrote our own JWT based authentication system. And we kind of leveraged our existing Postgres database that was there to be able to just push some of the authentication data and things of that sort. You know, with this, we kind of got to a point where we could take a, like a unit of this and we could deploy it without any problem, right? So that's essentially where we got to so far. Now, you know, here is what we ended up with finally, guys. I mean, I think actually we ended up actually having about 18 containers to deal with before we actually started working. You know, we were able to host this on two different uh, hardware, right? Each of them about 12 GB RAM and about four vCPU and about 100 GB SSD. But if you really look at it finally, it kind of became at about 18 containers to begin with. Right? There are about two minimum for each of the smart contracts, some peers, some order CAs, you know, each container is running for Postgres and then Hyperledger Explorer DB and then our business services, right? So this is essentially where we kind of finally ended up with. Now it took us almost about 10 sprints, right? And about 60 members and many more helping us. And, you know, you know here is where we actually landed up with. So, this is the solution. I'll probably do one thing. I'll just sign out. So basically, we kind of were able to lock, you know, this is now actually a solution that's running with a complete blockchain backend, right? And we also integrated this with uh, uh, Google, right? So that it is easy for us to sign up and things of that sort. For the purposes of demo today, I've just created three fictitious uh, entities, right? One is Anand, other one is someone called Bhanu, and third one, someone called Driti. Even though Driti is not fictitious, so she's a part of my team. So, uh, you know, essentially what it does, so what we'll do is that, you know, we'll say Anand is a landlord who wants to actually, let us say, let, you know, rent out his uh, 
apartment for rent, right? And then he wants to actually have a, a rent agreement executed. So let us say that he actually comes in. Okay. And then I probably will just sign in with Google. So it's easier for me. And then I'll just confirm. And then I just, oh my God. That's, so demo gods are not really, okay. I'll probably have to sign up first. I'll sign in. I'm already existing. So that means I'll probably go here. I did a manual registration, I suppose. Gautam and Somik are like, what are you doing? Right, so I'll come here and my, I just created this particular guy. So let me see. This is my, what's my username? Okay, this is my username. I'll copy this. I'll come here. I'll put this here. I suppose I give Anand123 as my password. Oh, yes. Okay, I logged in. So now I just executed this before I logged in. So essentially, it's a very simple UI. And, and what I did was I've also created a signature for myself. I could go here, but I can actually add a signature, right? So I will come here. And I'll change my signature, let us say, and then I'll say insert. It'll actually just update my existing signature. Now I have just created, now this is like a simple signature that actually I've created for myself. So now I'll come here and what I'll do is I'll come and I will probably start a new signature process. I'll just come to your browse and then I'll go to download. I just got this rent deed, which is, I oops, which is something that I downloaded off the internet. And now, you know, the file conversion API got kicking in, right? And then it kind of went ahead. It uploaded the whole thing on IPFS as we're speaking right now. And then, you know, okay, now this is essentially the overall rent agreement. Okay, now I'll come down and I'll say next. Now I'll need three people. Uh, let us say I am the owner and then I have a tenant. And then finally a witness, three people that I need to add. So I will say Anand is the owner that I actually created. So I will add me. And then I will actually, I said Banu at gmail.com. I just created some names team for today's demo. Did you miss the you? I did. Thank you for catching that. I'll just confirm that. Okay. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. And then I will add Driti Oops. All right, so now I go here, next comes the actual design section, right? So where you basically will be able to just take, drag, drop and insert all the three, right? I mean, as you look at it, all of these things was actually written in let us say in ReactJS, right? So the entire team kind of work together to be able to do this. And then, okay, oops, Anand is the owner. Now I'll click on Bhanu. I will put Bhanu signature here. And then I'll come to Driti. I would click Driti and I'll put that signature here. Of course, we still need to sort of fine tune all of these experiences team, which will probably will finish up. So finally, you know, you actually look at it. Okay, now there are three specific pages. I'll take a look at it. Okay, all of them seems to be fine. Now I'll say next. And then hopefully an email should go to all the three of them. <clears throat> okay, so now the document is actually gone, right? So now if I come here, hopefully I should see an email coming, right? So there is an email that says, hey, you have a document to sign. From who? From Anand, the creator. I'll come here. I'll click on this. I will actually have to sign in or another way to do it is if I have already logged in, if I go to my system, you see that hey, there is actually a document that is already pending. Now, if I click on this, you notice there's an IPFS hash here. So this basically is coming from the IPFS we actually we are creating and this activity that you're seeing essentially is already coming up on the blockchain. Now, if I actually come here and what I've done is I have also we have also hooked in our Hyperledger Explorer. So I'll just come here, I'll take this transaction hash and I will actually go to, let's see if we go to Hyperledger Explorer and 
Oops. Figure out if we could find the transaction. Transaction ID. Yeah. So if I come here, if you look at it, it is already there, and this particular record was gotten created, right? So from now there is like an entire payload here, right? So which is essentially contains everything, including a public key certificate stamping on the chain itself, right? Now I could come here and I could complete here itself, right? If I click here and if I come here and then if I come down and then I should be able to find the place where I'm supposed to sign, I'll just click on that. And well, it actually, whatever the signature that I put in should actually come here. And if I say complete, you know, at this point of time, my part of the process is complete, correct? So now if I go back and see the transaction, you should be able to see that there is another entry that is created. Basically, a new transaction got created. And then if you go, you should be able to find this on the blockchain. All right, now I have so many open, my apologies. I should have been, okay. So I should get the new one. So as you can see, as and when the transaction is happening, I'm able to get to the transaction log on the blockchain itself, right? And then of course, the second person goes, let's say it is Banu, I should be able to see it. I have a new signature, right? And then I will sign in, I'll move forward. So I should be able to then go ahead. I should see that there is already a document that is actually up for my signature. This is already there. I will just sign it. I'll complete and next goes to Dhriti. I will actually come here. I should have received an email too. I just go there and then I sign in as Dhriti. I go in, right? I should actually find that I am on the witness side. Oops. I sign. In fact, I had just created these signatures for the sake of speed, right? So that's about it. And then I complete, right? So essentially at this point of time, the entire transaction is complete. Any one of us could see what is the transaction that actually or other, what has happened to this. As you can see at this point of time, it is complete. And then I'm able to see the entire audit trail here, right? So, and then of course, each of this particular transaction got created on the block. Now at this point of time, it's easier for us to assertively find out that, you know, these particular transactions have been completed at that set time. And one of the other things that we also were built it was the verification system, right? Now, we had to do a lot of cryptographic magic in the background to be able to complete this verification. Basically, see today, one of the things, and I'll talk about what, what is the next step that we actually are looking at as well is, like, you know, if you click on verify today, basically what is happening is we are trying to really check if the public key that actually is being used and the signature that Anand actually made on the document is it really verifiable, right? So we created a message digest along with this whole thing signed from his private key and then loaded it as a part of the block. And then we take that, take the, the public key that is actually there for Anand and then try to verify that, right? A typical public key cryptographic verification system that actually we have created. Now, we want to take this further as well to see how can we actually create a digitally validatable signature. You know, currently today it is still like a GIF image, right? Now that's kind of a very quick demo team. And you can always download this particular document, right? If you downloaded this one, you can see that everybody who's completed the signature is here. One of the other thing that actually we have to also add is the whole provenance part of it, right? Like basically the same get history API will get added as a part of the PDF as well, and it should be ready. Now that was a quick demo uh, team. I hope you guys kind of were able to follow along. I hope I was not fast. I hope it kind of gave you a sense of what this particular tool can do, right? Uh, I'm hoping that there are no questions. That's why it's very quiet. But if there is anything at this point of time, we'd be happy to answer. So there are three questions. And uh, if you open your chat, then you will be able to see last three. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. How do I get to my chat? Okay, here. Uh, Zoom chat. Okay. Uh, I see that. So I tried to answer this question in sound chat. Uh, okay, yeah, Somic seems to have answered the question. Uh, it works on email as in whenever you sign up using your email, then the pair of keys created using your email as a common name on the 
on the certificate authority. So the key is uh, generated against the email. So when we are verifying, we verify uh, the common name against the email that is the verifier's email, signer's email. Yeah. And Virendra asks, can this work on email? Uh, this can work on email, meaning I didn't follow the question. Or maybe it is a continuation or something. I think uh, the question would be that, you know, would it work on the email? You know, can I sign my email? I think that's what you mean to require. Okay, so basically, I mean, you, your email is your identifier in this case, and the, a certificate will get issued using that email. Right? That's how the identity gets established. I'm not sure if that answers the question. So you create a PDF out of it, and that's how, and you know, you put a signature on top, right? That's how you're signing it, correct? Uh -huh. So the signature gets so created, in, and a new PDF gets uploaded onto IPFS. So the IPFS hash keeps changing at every point. Yeah, I suppose the answer in that case, you know, uh, Virendra would be that, you know, uh, it won't be on the email itself. It would be that, you know, you take an email and then, you know, you create, convert that email into a, a PDF document and then, you know, put a sign on top. Right. So, but it won't work the way the digital signatures and, you know, for example, you know, if I have signed a PDF, uh, like normal PDF, for example, you know, digitally signed, right? So there, the digital signature also gets embedded as a metadata of the PDF. Does that, you know, happens here as well? Yeah, absolutely. So we are on that journey right now, actually. So the next step essentially is, you know, this is mostly it resembles your DocuSign workflow today. If you really look at it, that's what essentially is happening today, um, uh, you know, Vikram. But then as a next step, that's what we're actually going to do is basically we already have the necessary uh, ingredients, right? I have the private key, I have the public key and everything. So the next thing that we're looking at is basically creating the metadata as a part of it. So that way, even outside of this, if you open it in something like Adobe, for example, right? So that's what you're saying, right? So if I actually open something like this, right? Like for example, if I click on this, right? So actually Adobe tells you that this is actually a valid signature, right? Are you able to see my screen? So this is essentially where we're going next. To be yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at it now. Yeah. So, right, so just... you're saying here it would happen here. Uh, yeah. Like... like. So we're not there yet. But definitely, okay. I think that's the next step, actually, Vikram. Right? So we thought we had enough to okay. come and showcase that. But you're right. So basically, today, I already have a combination of public and private. Right? So I should be able to use that. The only thing is that if I actually have a certificate authority's root certificate, generated from a trusted third party, and then subsequent certificates get issued from that CA, then I can easily trust the, I mean, I can trace the provenance back to a valid issuer at the beginning, right? And that's essentially the next step that we're looking to do. Okay. And the security of the solution relies on, uh, so essentially you have, you know, you are offering, you would offer this as a service, right? Because, you know, there is only one organization that is doing it at this moment, right? Uh -huh. uh, in terms of pipe and fabric. So if, you know, let's suppose this were to be used by, uh, let's suppose, for, you know, public authorities or something like that, in that case, they would want the sol solution to be more decentralized, let's suppose. So yeah. what are your plans for that? No, you're right. So, and, and we'll talk about that, right? So basically our learnings essentially team so far is that you know, the guest, get history APIs themselves were sufficient for us to deliver the auditorial functionality, which is really powerful for us, right? So we actually were able to, we didn't have to write anything new, right? So for us to be able to build that out, we were able to leverage even the users get history or the documents get, get history API for us to be able to generate the entire auditorial that is on the site, right? And user certificates could be actually created or used to create a digitally variable, verifiable signatures, which is what actually we're looking at. And then IPFS nodes should, could truly be used as decentralized storage, but you're not tested the failure and recovery, right? I mean, it goes back to the question that actually you are actually asking, Vikram, right now is what would be the deployment, correct? So what would be the applications part of it? Now, today, the way, correct. the way actually I am thinking about this, Vikram, again, high level thoughts is that we should be able to deploy this as a Kubernetes deployable pod on any enterprises data center. Right. And 
you, if two organizations are looking to actually engage in a, a documentary transaction, right? You could actually create two different pods and two different organizations. They could join onto the same blockchain network. And then you could actually use this only within that organization to be able to create a more cryptographically verifiable signatures between only these two entities, right? It's not really that we have to create that and manage that as a service. Technically, right, so we'd like to challenge and see if we can actually go and deploy this. As I said, even if it's a public entity or a private entity, whoever they are. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So from a perspective of where do we go from here, right? So, I mean, one is definitely enterprise single sign-on, right? Should we actually look at exploring integration with decentralized identity providers, right? And thirdly, you know, the wallet today, if you really look at it still, and, and, and this is something that we are internally discussing as well, to see the wallet is still managed within the peer level, right? At the peer level and things. So how can we actually deliver this to the user itself, right? Like, should we have a mobile app where the ID gets delivered to the user and then the actual signature happens when somebody scans the QR code of sorts, right? So that way, the actual private key is not even sitting somewhere on the server. It actually is delivered to the user itself. And then you're able to actually do you know, it's like a two factor of sorts, right? To something that you have and something that you know, right? So sort of a thing and then move forward, right? That's kind of the, the next step that actually we are thinking to go forward, right? So Tim, that's essentially what we had, right? So from today's presentation perspective, I really hope it kind of gave you a perspective of what our learnings and sharing has been. Um, you know, it has been truly an enjoyable journey for us, so to say, definitely. Uh, uh, and, and it will continue to work more and then I can bring another update at another point of time but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. I hope this was useful, helpful. Any feedback would be appreciated. Yes, definitely, definitely. You know, it, uh, at least from my perspective, yes. Uh, it's been, you know, great thing. And uh, so I guess, you know, uh, one of the, uh, I know that, you know, there can be, you know, so many things that can be built, but, you know, it can become, you know, truly, uh, like, great, you know, like, I, I would presume that, you know, probably, you should also put into your roadmap, you know, then like now you are signing those documents. If those documents were actually contract, right? Converting that into blockchain because that is where, you know, you, you'll see good market as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you all. Yeah. I think Kartike has a question. He wants to understand that, you know, the, what is the DLT part of it because you're only using one node. Huh. So currently, I mean, that's a good question, right? And a challenge. I mean, we wanted to keep it simple right now, Karthik, right? So, but then if let us say there were two, two organizations were involved, I mean, I'll just make it up, right? Like, let us say there are two banks who wants to issue LOC. Now this document needs to actually be delivered from one bank to another, right? And then this is the document that needs to be signed by the signatories of both the banks. Then you could actually create two instances of the same app and then have them come up together on a, on a common channel and both of them can have their own users. But then because of the blockchain nature of it, the, the copy of this particular transaction would happen in both the places, right? So that is when it truly becomes a distributed ledger. Until then, it probably mostly is taking care of immutability and provenance and things of that sort, right? Consensus will come in when two or three enterprises will start coming. Hopefully that answers the question. So there's a question, which entities constitute the participants in the network asking them from a fabric architecture point? So basically here, the main participant is an organization, right? And then our users under that. So any two organizations who would like to actually engage in a shared fact, which is basically like, let us say two real estate companies are coming up in a joint development. They are actually trying to sign a lot of documents almost on a daily basis, and they have signatories on both the end, then each of them can actually create an instance of these and then come together on a common network, right? Again, I'm hopefully making sense, right? So if you guys don't follow it, please let me know. I'd be happy to kind of elaborate on this further, right? So that is what would be my idea of an organization uh, or a participant in the network. It looks like- That makes sense, yeah. Jay. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, all right. If there are no more questions, then Vikram and uh, uh, Kamlesh, back to you guys. Thank you so much for providing us the opportunity to present our learnings. Thanks, Jay, for the end of this wonderful presentation. My pleasure, Vikram. Thank you. At what moment did we stop the recording? I see that recording is not happening at this time. Oh, no, it is. It is Someone happening. Is yeah, it is happening. So, just a second. I'll stop it then.